All right, I want to welcome everyone to our October Pecan Topics. And we have a couple of guests today that are going to be with us to talk about uh, uh, soil sampling and then about marketing your crop. So I'm interested to see how, how um, they present their information, what they've got to tell us today. I'm going to start by sharing my screen. My, I'm sorry, my name is Becky Carroll, and I'm the Extension Specialist for Pecans at Oklahoma State University. And I want to, um, if I can remember how to do this today, uh, I'm going to share my screen. And Chad, can you see that all right? Is it all right? You can see the whole screen. Yeah. yeah. All right, so I want to, um, you're seeing the full screen, right, Peter? Yes. Okay. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about some of the, the topics that you need to be thinking about during the month of October. And our fact sheet, HLA 6200, Calendar for Pecan Growers, it lists out uh, what you need to be concerned with for each month of the year. And so today on our topics, we have uh, orchard floor that we're talking about. You want to make sure that you're, if you have um, any kind of divots from cattle or wild hogs or deer or anything, that those are kind of cleaned up and filled in before the nuts fall on the ground. You also want to mow your ground cover. Make sure that, um, that it's not going to impede your harvest as well with your, with your harvesters. And then in October, we recommend planting container pecan trees if, if you can find them at this time. Um, going into this, this season, if it's really dry, with drought conditions, you're going to have to pay more attention to uh, how you plant these and how you take care of them to get them to, to grow and do their best. But container trees are, are actually, it's a good time to plant those. Um, our pecan management class, we grow trees in the class during the year, and then uh, in a couple of weeks during our last class, the class members will be able to take some pecans home and be able to plant those trees in their orchards. So they'll, they'll get to end the season with about, uh, about five trees each, so it's kind of fun. So they've grown them from seed. And then also things to consider are harvest early, especially if you have improved varieties. You want to hit the the sales before uh, before the Thanksgiving and, and Christmas time, get those into uh, the, the people that are selling those pecans, or if you're selling them, make sure that you get them to the people when they really are, the demand is high. And then we're also going to talk about wildlife and, and pest control today. Last month during our Zoom, we had uh, Jacob Harriet, our, uh, he was a uh, game warden in Lincoln County, and he talked about how to manage wildlife legally. And I'm gonna give you a few options on how to do some of those control measures. And then Chad Selman is gonna talk about marketing pecans, how to sell your crop. And also um, then we're gonna have Mike Rose talk about soil testing and why that's important for a pecan grower. So just to show you what it looks like at the research station at Perkins, at Cimarron Valley Research Station, I took these pictures yesterday. Uh, we've got our Kansas clusters. Most of them are, are opening up nicely. Uh, they're a little bit behind the Pawnee. The Pawnee are usually the first thing to open besides Peruk, which is a northern variety and extremely early. But uh, you can see these Pawnee shucks are starting to open up pretty, pretty good. The Kansas, they're starting to split and open and um, look re really pretty nice. And then our Merrimack, they're kind of a mid-season ripening pecan, and um, they're, they're not quite at shuck split yet, but they will be opening uh, hopefully pretty soon. They've got some scab on them this season, both on the Pawnee and on the Merrimack, but I don't think it's going to be bad enough to impede the, the shucks opening this, this year. It's kind of unusual for us to have sh uh, shuck uh, scabbed on the shucks at Perkins because we have a lot of airflow, we're upland, um, and we, we don't usually have a lot of scab pressure. So it's kind of unusual. Just to show you what the inside of, of some of the nuts look like, this is our Kansas. I just cut it in half to show you what the, how well filled it is. Um, this is the Pawnee and it's all filled out completely. 
And then the Merrimack still has a shuck on it, but you can see it's it's almost completely filled out, but it still can, if we get additional rainfall, it still can fill out some more. Some of those kernels that have a lot of scab on them or the, the shucks that do, it really is not showing up too deep into that shuck, so I don't think it's going to affect how it opens up. One thing that we did see in an area of the, the orchard, it's kind of, um, it's our big Merrimack block over next to an area where we removed about seven acres of pecans. And those trees had not been managed as well. And so in this area, we are seeing some uh, hickory shuckworm. Whenever I was cutting them open to look uh, at how well they had filled out, I was finding some shuckworm um, where they had been tunneling into that shuck. Right here, you can see the little shuckworm uh, feeding on, on the inside of that shuck. And then um, right here, I think is another shuckworm right here. But they actually feed in between the shell and that shuck portion. And that can cause some issues depending on, on if it's early season shuckworm, they usually fall off the tree. But if it's about that shell hardening time, then we can end up with, with things like uh, the kernel development may not be as, as, as good. Uh, we also might um, have scarring and discoloration of that shell. We also may see that the shucks are stuck uh, when it's harvest time, they just don't open up because of the shuckworm damage. And, um, and also it delays the maturity of the, that nut development. So, um, you know, it's really too late to do much about it unless you have, um, if you can do some sanitation practices, if you have a yard tree and you have shuckworm, be sure and collect all those fallen nuts and get rid of those if you see shuckworm. And um, because they're gonna overwinter in shucks and leaf litter and things. So uh, make sure that you clean up if you can. But if you have shuckworm damage in a commercial orchard, you need to be thinking about controlling that uh, before kind of right at that shell hardening stage next year. And then another thing that I found that is a little bit unusual for, uh, for Perkins um, is we're finding some pecan weevil damage. And um, unfortunately, um, well, fortunately for myself and my husband, we took a trip to Alaska this year, but my husband is the one that applies all the insecticide and fungicide sprays normally at the research station. Well, the timing for the Merrimack pecan was when we were in Alaska this year. And so the people that took over and sprayed for pecan weevil this year, they didn't include those Merrimack trees. And so they sprayed the Pawnee and the Kansas, but they didn't do the Merrimack. And so we're seeing some weevil infestation in our Merrimack trees. And so you can see this one's been, I think, is cut in half, but you can see where they've been feeding inside that, that kernel. Here's one that's a little bit, um, it's, it's kind of rotted a little bit, and then it kind of depends on when they are, uh, the eggs are laid in there, but here you can see this nut, when I cut it in half, I actually had four of those grubs crawl out of that one one uh, half of the pond. So there was a couple in this side and a couple in that side. And uh, so they were almost finished uh, with their development and they would soon be chewing a hole through that shell and through the shuck, squeezing out and dropping to the ground to start the process all over. They stay in the ground for a couple of seasons um, before we get a big rainfall that, that in two or three seasons and they come back out climb up the, the tree as an adult and start the whole process over. My husband, Jimmy, was out uh, harassing the crows yesterday or day before, and he said that it was raining pecan larva, pecan weevil larva on, uh, on him. And he looked down and there was like three or four larva that had just fallen out of a nut and were, had gone to the ground. So they're getting ready to go back into the ground to, uh, to overwinter for two or three years. And so he didn't let them get away. He went ahead and did mechanical uh, control by smashing them and uh, got rid of those. But you can see Weevil can do a lot of damage. And uh, if you don't stay on top of your spray program can cause a lot of issues. The Kansas and Pawnee, because of their development is earlier, they were sprayed earlier when they went from that gel 
uh, the water to gel and dough stage. The Merrimack are further behind, so they missed out on that, that perfect timing for spraying. Another thing, we talked about pecan scab on some of the trees. This is Merrimack. And these areas that you can see that are kind of cracked, um, that is, is normally showing where it was old. So it's not really actively expanding. And so it was, I think a lot of our scab infection was in that June and July period. And so it, there's not a lot that look this bad, but there are a few. Most of them just have lesions that are kind of spotted. Um, but you can see this nut, because of the scab, it's already starting to open. So it's probably not going to open properly. Um, but whenever I cut open this nut, this half, and looked at the kernel development, it didn't look that bad. So if the nut goes ahead and, and the shuck opens, that kernel may still be okay. Now, the reason that we see a lot of, of scab pressure at the research station was it was just perfect storm this year for, for scab development. And this is a map showing scab hours for the entire season. And if you, it, we talked earlier in the year that um, very susceptible varieties only need 10 scab hours to have an infection. And those things would be like um, Squirrel, Western, Wichita. Some of those are very highly susceptible. So only 10 hours of, of the right conditions can cause an infection. The moderately susceptible cultivars like Pawnee and Merrimack, those take about 20 hours of, of the right conditions for scab infection. And then things that are more resistant, like our native pecans and some of the other things like Kansas and, and other lower um, susceptibility, they can take up to 30 hours before they require a fungicide application. And if you look at the, the research station at Perkins, we had almost 400 hours, which is a lot compared to the, a normal season. But what we normally see, you can, you can kind of tell on this map, the darker green areas are lower scab hours. So we don't think of having any scab hours in the panhandle normally. And it's usually a definite kind of right down I-35 I-35 that goes straight down Oklahoma, this half of the state is usually much drier. We don't see a lot of scab hours. We do see a lot of scab in the eastern section, and it's always much higher in the southeast because there have a lot more humidity and rainfall. And so we usually see high numbers down here. This is not unusual. But normally, this darker green is going to be about half of the state. So these people down in this area that usually grow those those uh, highly susceptible cultivars may end up with a lot of scab this year. So I want to show you a map. So this is what it looked like this year for the entire season. Now, if you look at this is 2018, 2017, 19, and 20, you can see it's got that definite kind of, of change where it's darker green in this area. Now, um, let me see, it was, 2019, we did have kind of higher scab hours in areas, but still down in the southwestern part, we didn't see a lot of, of pressure. Uh, but occasionally we get a lot more scab hours up into this area. But you can see um, this, this past year in, in 2021, we just had a lot more hours over the entire state pretty much. So we're going to see a lot more scab infection, may cause some issues with our harvest this year. Another problem that we've, we've had this uh, late summer is drought. We haven't had a lot of good rainfall. And so this was the drought map September 28th and, and October 5th. And we did have a rainfall in between these two uh, maps, but it didn't do a whole lot. We had a more rainfall in this area and a little bit in here that caused uh, it get to go down to abnormally dry instead of the moderately dra uh, moderate drought. But I believe I heard about 93% of the state is under some type of, of drought condition or potentially drought condition. So hopefully we're, we're forecasted to have some good rains this next uh, Sunday through Tuesday or Wednesday. Hopefully that will help with our, with our trees. Um, if we're too dry, we're going to end up having some issues with the shucks opening, and also our trees can go into the winter stressed if they're not 
um, if they don't have enough moisture in the ground. So this is the rainfall amounts for, uh, for August and September across the state. And this is usually the time when the nuts are filling. And we recommend when people are growing improved variety pecans to irrigate and give them at least two inches of rainfall a week. And so if people didn't have a supplemental irrigation to go along with this rainfall, they, their quality may be suffering a little bit this year. So we can see some areas um, up around where Chad, um, Chad Selman uh, lives, they didn't receive much rain at all during that critical uh, fill time. Now, the last 10 days, we have had some rainfall. Like I, I said earlier, we, it came down through here. That's where that yellow strip kind of showed back up on the map. And up through here, we had a little bit of where the drought uh, monitor was, was lessened a little bit. But we need a lot more rain to make, uh, make some differences on that drought monitor map. Another thing that we, we really work really hard on this time of the season is, is working to protect the crop from wildlife. And when they're on the ground, these are some ponies that were, that were there on the ground. When they're on the ground, they're susceptible to deer, wild hogs, possum, raccoons, squirrels, everything likes pecans. And so we have a plethora of different wildlife on the research station. And so we have to work hard to try to keep them uh, out of the area and, and harvest early so we don't have to share as many with those with those critters. And so I've seen a lot of feeding like this. Uh, they'll eat the outside and, and leave just a little bit attached to that packing material in the middle. Um, I think it's probably squirrel. And then we've also had some wild hogs move into the, the orchard. And so they're starting to root up some of the areas, the, the uh, herbicide strips. And this makes harvest much more difficult. If those nuts fall into these divots where they've rooted, the harvester will not pick them up. And so we're gonna try to, to scare them, to, to move them out of the orchard, but it's really difficult to get, uh, to get them to move on unless you have some type of, of dogs that are hunting or you know, kind of pushing them out. And we're very close to, uh, to the town and to the golf course and everything. So you wouldn't think that they would be that close, but wild hogs are, are not afraid of people that, that often. So some of the methods of wildlife control are exclusion and habitat modification. Sometimes these are difficult to do and can be expensive. Uh, there's repellents, harassment, toxicants, trapping, hunting, and a few other methods, but those crows can live for many, many years. And a lot of those animals are very, very smart. They get used to what you're doing and they, they're like, well, that's just Becky out there and she's not gonna hurt me. But if Jimmy shows up, he's the one that carries around that, that gun that might hurt me. So they know the people that are out there. And so when I'm in the orchard, they don't really, leave they just watch me but if it's one of the other guys that is out there hunting or doing something else then they are really watching them closely so we need to use multiple approaches to uh, keep them at bay so some of the exclusion and modification of habitat you know fencing if you've got an area where you just cannot keep them out fencing an area may may be beneficial we've got about three quarters of a mile of, of hog fence up. And so we've been able to keep the wild hogs out for, for a while, but now they're, they're venturing down and around and coming in another way. So, um, so that can be an issue. Uh, they've also torn open the, the hog fence and they're getting under it or through it as well. So they're, they're pretty adaptable to different situations. Um, if you've got brush piles that may be harboring uh, other type of critters, clean those up. Uh, if you have wooded areas that are very close to your uh, improved varieties or your native areas that aren't managed, if you can develop a buffer zone where you can push that back more and have an open area where maybe um, hawks or eagles or other type of predators, maybe even coyotes can come in. And if those squirrels are moving back and forth, they're more uh, susceptible to getting 
swiped up by by a crow or by a hawk or an eagle or something. And then if you have den trees in the orchard, those would be the first ones that you would consider thinning uh, when it's time to do a thinning project. I had one grower contact me and she said she had a pair of eagles that were nesting in her orchard. And she said that she has had very little problems with crows this year and wondered if, if that might be the, you know, the reason. So if we can uh, improve the number of those raptor type of birds, you know, it will help with the, with the squirrel population, keep them down. Um, just some other harassment type of, of uh, things that we see in the orchard. We've got propane cannons. This is one that's on a tripod. And when it, it shoots uh, from with the propane, it kind of swings around. So it's not stationary in one direction. Now at the research station, we, we point ours away from town. So we're not getting that echoing into the town. But in, in, a, in a big orchard, these that move around, it may help with, with some of that harassment. Um, just any kind of noise. So propane cannons on the ground, um, these uh, pyrotechnics, these um, whiz, what are they called? Whiz bangs or bird bangers. They, they're they um, dispatched with this little gun and it goes out like a firecracker and it's there's screamers and, and different things. So it just alarms the birds, keeps them wondering what's going on and so they'll leave. Uh, we have bird guards that use solar panels to, um, to charge the battery and it sends out sounds uh, distress calls. And so it keeps those, those critters wondering what's going on as well. And so these work pretty well if you get them in the, in the orchard early on. And then this is something that we just started using in the last couple of years. It's actually called a, a thunder it's from Thunder Equipment. It's a mini boomer. And they use these in, um, in dog training for like retrievers. But you use a canister, a, a butane canister that screws on the end of this. So you're not actually having to, um, you know, use a gun or buy different types of, of things to add to this, just keep the butane full. And you can walk around, keep this in your vehicle or, or on a on a four wheel or whatever, and just occasionally just pop it off. And it keeps them, it's, it's, it's very loud. Uh, it sounds like just like a shotgun or something. And, and it works really well. The guys at the station really like using this. And um, it seems to be helping just keep things, um, keep the animals kind of on their toes, what's going on. And then decoys, sometimes we'll just park a pickup out in the orchard. And so they think someone's out there. We've also used scarecrows before, and if they can move or something, that also is beneficial. Or um, some people, they keep dogs around the orchard to keep the squirrels in check. Toxic toxicants are, are only good for uh, gophers. And in uh, small areas, you can use a gopher probe. In larger areas, uh, a gopher plow is, is uh, beneficial to go down the rows or around the perimeter. Um, and uh, and it, it really helps. The gophers, especially on young establishing trees, can eat all of the roots, and uh, you won't know that there's a problem until the tree starts leaning over and it, and it dies outright. And you can pull it up and, and there's absolutely no roots on it at all. So watch out for gopher mounds and treat those as you see them. Trapping and hunting is another option uh, last, week, uh, last month. You can go back and listen to the, the game warden talk about the regulations and the seasons, but um, trapping, hunting, those are all important things to do. Uh, we use this type of trapping system where we put a, a kind of a perch up with the leg hole trap. The squirrels run up the tree, they get a nut, and before they get on the ground, they stop on the last branch. And so this is the last area that, and they'll stop and get caught there. Um, the, the game warden also said, you know, relocating raccoons is not always the best thing to do because you're not really solving the problem. You're just giving the problem to someone else. Uh, they also need to protect from those two-legged uh, critters that might be encroaching on your crop. Um, posting signs around the perimeter of your orchard no trespassing signs, uh, try to keep people uh, from coming in and picking up your pecans because uh, some people don't understand this private property. So post uh, around the perimeter just to keep the people um, 
out of there. This is an apple orchard, but you get the idea there. Uh, the last webinar that we have for this year is going to be on November 5th. And so uh, be sure and sign up for that one for our last one of the season. But um, I believe that's all I have for, um, for my section. And do we have any questions about anything that I talked about? You can either unmute or post it in the chat box. All right. Well, I think we're going to have uh, we're going to have Chad Selman with Selman Nut Company. He's in Skytook, and he's going to talk about um, how to sell your crop. And he's going to talk about uh, different manners for for either um, smaller growers or for wholesale growers. So, um, do you would you like to unmute Chad? And and you're welcome to. Uh... <coughs> Absolutely. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, sure. Uh, so I grew up in the pecan industry. Uh, mm -hmm. My dad had a pecan uh, operation and uh, we harvest, uh, he's retired now. And uh, so I've been doing it for uh, by, by myself for about uh, 10 years or so. And uh, <clears throat> uh, we harvest mainly natives. Uh, we're about 90% natives and about 10% improved. Um, we harvest uh, many different orchards throughout the a region. Uh, and so we can see different different areas as far as rainfall and such like stuff like that, like you're looking at the drought monitor. Um, I also own Selma Nut Company, which I just started this year. Um, it is a, I sell retail through e-commerce, which is online store. And I also do wholesale kernels as well, uh, the nut meats uh, uh, <clears throat> inside the pecans. So when I sell other nuts as well, almonds, cashews, and pistachios, and peanuts, and uh, I do more than just just the raw nut. I also do candies and stuff like that, like chocolate covered and pralines and stuff like that. So uh, that's kind of my background, and um, I'll get started here. I'll probably start out with the retail, start on the smaller end, and then we'll work our way to the wholesale. Uh, so on the retail end. You know, most a lot of people have uh, shops that they put up, and you need to make sure that the shop is on a good road that has a high traffic with a good turn in. You know, people want to feel safe turning into your shop and pulling out of it, uh, especially since most of the people that are going to come into the shops are kind of on the elderly side. You know, they're the ones baking the pies and stuff like that. Oh, no. uh, and, and so you want to make sure it is good and safe. Uh, you also, you want to make sure to have a sign out so people can see that your shop is there. You want to have it on your building as well as out in front uh, at the turn in. Um, you, <clears throat> and I would suggest not just selling pecans, but selling a few different things um, as it as when they come in, they can uh, they can buy more than just a pecan. They can buy a walnut or an almond or um, cashew or whatever they're looking for. It doesn't mean you need to have a bunch of it, but I would suggest trying putting a little bit in your store as well. Uh, <clears throat> especially having little pecan candies. Uh, those are very good sellers during the holidays. And your chocolate covered pecans, your praline pecans, uh, things of that nature. When you're pricing these, you need to make sure they're priced high enough, but you don't want to be too high where it scares away your customer. So on, a whole, on the wholesale end, you look at it, okay, these pecans are worth, uh, just for example, a dollar a pound. So what is my cost to get this to sell it at a dollar a pound? And what is my cost to sell it at $4 a pound? And what is, how much more cost am I incurring by retailing these? And so you need to look at that as you're pricing them and make sure that you do have them priced high enough to where you're making a profit. Because just because you sell it more than the wholesale price doesn't mean you're profiting because of the higher cost. <clears throat> then, uh, you, and, and if you, it'd be always be good to create a website uh, for your store if you want to retail uh, larger amounts. Um, but if you do, uh, I would suggest that you definitely need to market your website uh, in some form or fashion, uh, like using Facebook or um, LinkedIn, um, uh, you know, things of that nature. Uh, you, there's also companies out there that are, some can be fairly cheap. You just have to shop around, but you, you wanna make sure you get a quality company as well, not just pay for someone to, that really doesn't know what they're doing. Um, you, and you can buy advertisements with them. 
uh, or they can um, direct you in a way uh, that they think would be best for your store. And so those are the great, great ways to, um, to market pecans on a retail level. Uh, having a store is great. Uh, you get a lot of foot traffic. Uh, when they come in, they're generally going to buy something. Um, the good part about uh, e-commerce is having an online store is that you don't have to mess with the people. Uh, you just put it in a box and then ship it. Um, but then, then they're not seeing your store as well. So you have goods and bads on both. So, so uh, Chad, is, is there um, things that you need to think about when you're retailing about how you sell your product um, to meet health codes and things, or do you, are you, do you talk about like uh, processing or anything like that? Do you suggest people might yes. crack their own or hire that out? Or what do you think would be beneficial for a lot of growers? Yeah. So I'd say for most retailers, it is much better to hire that out, the shelling process of the pecan, uh, because they're going to get sanitized in the correct way. And you need when you send it to a sheller to get sanitized, you need to make sure that they have those, uh, those practices in place, and that they have the correct documentation. Because if something were to ever happen, they're going to go and come back and look at that, say, where were these shelled? And you, then you can say, here, here's my paperwork. Here's a documentation. Uh, you know these guys shelled them. They have all the. They're doing all the procedures necessary. Um, also, you need to have a sales permit uh, through the state of Oklahoma uh, to be able to uh, to retail as well. And if you have a, and if you're storing any of your products, uh, if you sell, I'm not exactly sure what the correct uh, what the right amount is. If you sell over a certain amount, uh, you have to be inspected by um, uh, by the state to to Food and Health Department to make sure that it's sanitary uh, at your facility and if you're a retail shop as well, if you're doing retail also. Uh, so I'd highly suggest doing it, um, you know, seeing that off and getting the shell. Uh, there are a few people that I, that I know that do do uh, their own and that they, but they do a very large amount of retail and they do have all those practices in place and make sure that they are up to code on everything. So, um, <clears throat> you no. Know, on another end, once we get past the retail retail side of it, um, then you're moving on to the next next level, which I call the retail wholesale or gift pack market. So those are the those are the ones that are going to bring a premium, but you're not selling them at one pound at a time. You can be selling them anywhere between fifty to um, even semi loads uh, at a time move, move at that level. And, and those are going to other retailers who are going to put them into a, a nice little box and retail them uh, to customers around the holidays. And that's generally a very early season. There's only a limited time where that really works. Uh, it's generally in between, generally around October 15th, you know, the very first nuts that come off the tree all the way to uh, probably about mid November. That starts to fall off because the people that are uh, have those retail shops that are going out and buying those nuts, um, they have already acquired what they needed. Uh, but it is a very good way to get a premium on your on your pecans, and those are generally the the kind of the better varieties, uh, like your Pawnees, and I say better, the more sought after varieties that uh, that most people want around here. Is like your Pawnees and your Kansas. Uh, that's what people are looking for for the gift pack market. So, and then uh, once you do that, it kind of moves on to the wholesale market, and that's the, that's what I've been doing probably most of my life is wholesaling uh, semi loads at a time. Uh, I also buy pecans throughout this throughout the United States, um, and so I this is where most of my experience comes in, and. On a wholesale level, uh, on the improved varieties, you can, like I said, you can uh, you can get into some of those higher prices if you can get them out really quick. But if you wait a little bit, you know, prices are going to drop back down to uh, commercial grade shelling stock. And, and on the native level, there really isn't that gift pack market for those, unfortunately. 
maybe one day it'll be uh, it'll come alive, but uh, I'm not going to keep my hopes up too much. <laughs> but uh, uh, and one thing that uh, you know, there's a lot of growers out there that don't pick a semi load of pecans, and so my suggestion to those growers is if they can get um, lots put together, if they can go in with their neighbor and say, hey, this guy has 10,000 pounds, this guy has 25,000 pounds, this guy has 15, that creates a semi-load. And if they can bring them together into one place where a buyer doesn't have to go to all three places, you're gonna get a full price for that. They're not gonna be discounted. Whereas if, say, if I was to have to go to three different places, I have more time and more labor in it. And if I'm buying a single lot at a time, say 10,000 pounds at a time, the buyer is also taking a risk on whether the price goes up and down in the market to get a semi-load put together. So we're gonna discount that just a little bit to make sure that we can we can profit off of that. So is so I suggest to all growers that they would come to put it put it together into a semi-load lot because I want you guys, I want growers to get the most money that they can for their crop. And, and also to, you need to talk to uh, several buyers. Don't talk to just one buyer. Uh, there's five or six buyers in Oklahoma that you can talk to. Um, so say, hey, what's going, you know, when you talk to them, just ask them what's going on with the market. Is it going up? Is it going down? You know, um, you know, where's it at right now? And talk to them weekly uh, if you want, or talk to them every couple of days. Uh, uh, at least every two weeks, I would talk to them because the market changes so fast. Sometimes, I, I, you know, it might change three times in a day. And some buyers might be in the market and others might not. It depends on the shelter and who they're buying for and such. So you might talk to me today and I say, yep, price is $1.50 a pound. And you call me two days later and I say, sorry, I'm out of the market, I already filled the orders. So you, you definitely need to talk to several buyers and I'm more than happy to give out some names to uh, some buyers that are out there. Uh, you got uh, Bill Isle that, that's here in the Northeastern Oklahoma. Uh, Jared Miller's got a shelling plant. Uh, you got, uh, down in, Ard uh, in uh, Ardmore, you got Jerry Rutledge down there and uh, North Texas is uh, uh, Nancy McCoyne and, and Southern Oklahoma, Southeast is Kevin Crouch. You buy some down there. So there's several buyers around that you can talk to. Uh, and then uh, also uh, when, you're, when you're harvesting, if you have a sizer, I try to keep those varieties separate uh, out of your even out of the natives, but if you can keep even the varieties separate out of themselves, you might get a little bit more money. Um, and the recent, this last year was uh, definitely a difficult year to move uh, blends, which is everything's kind of just mangled and put together. Uh, shellers didn't want them, they wanted them separated already because the reason is that some of them are, might be longer and skinnier than others, and they might go in the same size hole when you're sizing them, but cracking them that makes more more pieces or more halves. If they're, uh, if they're more uniform, they can make much more halves and get those crackers set in tune just right. So definitely try to keep the varieties separate. Uh, if you have if you have enough um, enough of those varieties, if you don't, it's probably not going to make a big difference monetarily. Um, then I would just keep them keep them together. Same thing with the natives as well. Uh, you know, say on a semi load, if you only have a couple hundred pounds of have improved is not monetarily, it's not really worth keeping those separated um, because you're not really not gonna get that much more for them. It'd be more work and cost as far as equipment to keep that, keep to do that as well. So. Chad, I was just wondering on quality, um, do you need to keep, if you have some natives that are higher kernel percentage versus another area, is it important to, keep the quality the same in those shipments too, if possible? Yeah, absolutely. Um, especially uh, if, say, if you have a native that grades, most Oklahoma is going to grade in between a 39 or 40 up to uh, about a 42 and a half. Um, there's some parts in northern, far, far northern Oklahoma that's going to grade in 45s. And those are obviously sought after more. They get a little bit thinner shell and the higher grade or, or sought after. They get they might make an extra two to two to four cents uh, on those semi-loads, semi-load lots as well um, because of that. And then if you send, you're talking about weevils. Weevils is the number one thing in Oklahoma that will degrade your crop, degrade your the quality of that load. 
And that's where we get a lot of the lower grades is because someone didn't spray or someone didn't pick them out good enough. And if a sheller sees that they have, has a semi-load that has 10 weevils in this load in the, in the one pound sample and a semi-load that has zero, he's going to pay much, much more for this, for the weevils we get discounted much more than the load without the weevils. So it is very important to do that spraying and to pick your pecans out well and blow them out well. And to do that, they, there's you can <clears throat> mainly the, on the machine side to get those weevils out are blowers and aspirators and stuff like that. Those work very well to do that. Uh, and so anything that's below about a 38 um, on a native really kind of starts get price starts going down on them. Um, and 36s, some people might not even buy them until kind of towards the end of the year. If, you know, we're kind of running out of stuff to buy, then uh, I might try to buy those. But you need to really keep them around that 40% or better. Uh, that's where kind of most shellers look at uh, at buying uh, buying natives. There's there's I know some smaller shellers that they won't, I don't think they'll even buy anything below a 40. And then for your gift packs, your improved varieties, you really want to. Yeah. So that yeah. So that that gift pack market is the best of the best, and a lot of those, uh, uh, especially large lots, they actually get sized off. And so say you're anything below it's like a number 13 or 14 isn't going to go into that gift pack market it's going to go into the shelling stock it's one of those big nice bright color pecans and so just saying just say you went out and picked your harvested your pawnees and you didn't size them out at all uh there you know there's anything anywhere between uh you know a 10 and a and a 16 in there those aren't going to receive the premium that a load would if it was all number 14s because then that shelter is going to buy he's overpaying for the smaller pecans than than he would normally be can you explain what a 10 and a 14 and what all that means absolutely <laughs> so we use those numbers it's a 10 16 so we we size pecans on every 16 and so generally it's, it, it can get you can start them at a 7 16 if you want to but uh generally anything that's an eight it's so eight sixteenth and below is thrown out of the yield. And so that would be treated like a trash or an inedible because those are very difficult to shell. So then we start natives that say a nine and nine. So when we yield them, we say it has this many number eights in it. So they know how many pecans are gonna be taken out. So we start like a nine sixteenth, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, uh, 16 sixteenths, which, which is one inch. Uh, and I think that's and anything over that's Oh, it's all oversized, um, but there's not a lot of those that are over a one inch thick. Dad, is there a correlation between a 10 and 40% or does that vary a lot? I mean, is there a ballpark where you kind of have a feel for that? Yeah, so generally the, the lower the nut count, generally the better the yield uh, because there's more space in that pecan to create a kernel. Um, but that's not always the case. You can look at, look at a, a, a peruke is going to grade uh, tremendously well. Uh, you know, a good peruke is going to grade in the upper 50s, um, and it's only going to maybe nut count around 100, uh, you know, in between 90, and I've seen them up to, I've had perukes actually be 115 and still grade in the upper 50s. And so it depends more on the variety than it does the, the count. Anybody else have any questions? Do you want to talk about uh, we? A lot of the time, you don't get price per pound, but it's it's a, a price per. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So so how how we do it on a wholesale level is called we call it a price per point, uh, which that is basically the kernel price for the pecan that we're purchasing. So at a dollar, say the pecans are a dollar per point and your natives yield a 40%, then you would then get in turn get paid 40 cents. If it's $2 a point and you yield a uh, 40%, then you get paid 80 cents. And so when we're talking about that, um, that's, what we, that's the lingo that the buyers use with the shellers more than anything, um, or say uh, you haven't, uh, or you can contract your crop, crops as well. Say if you have, a semi-load or a couple semi-loads, um, you can call your buyer and 
and say, hey, I got five semi loads, what can I get today? And he's gonna give you a price per point. He's gonna say, I can give you 240 a point today, and then they'll grade them later at a later date, even if you don't have them harvested. Um, there's a lot of pecans that get sold that way. And, and that's where the yield really comes comes in, comes in on getting those weevils out and stuff like that when we grade the kernel. And that's only edible kernels. And I don't generally <clears throat> some buyers might be a little more than shellers uh, are more lenient than others are, and vice versa. And uh, generally, if it doesn't make a, a nice, pretty, fancy aff, if you wouldn't eat it, then it's going in the trash, unfortunately. So, and then, uh, and that's where those those yields really come into play, and and all the rainfall that you just saw, that all this stuff that Becky was talking about earlier makes a huge difference in in your ultimate selling of the crop, and marketing the crop. Anyone have any questions for Chad? You're welcome to unmute or to put it in the chat box. Chat with Chad. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, anything else, Chad, you think that is important for potential uh, growers, things to think about? Yeah, I just say, uh, you know, on the wholesale level, talk. Whoop. You're good. Yeah. Nice screen went off. Uh, on the wholesale level, I just say, you know, I want to emphasize, make sure and talk to your buyers regularly, uh, keep up with the market, because in the end, it could, could end up making you several thousand dollars or keeping you from losing several thousand dollars. Um, and those smaller people that have two or three, uh, you know, four or five trees that they go out and pick six or seven buckets if they wanted to, they could uh, generally take them, they have a local, several local crackers around, and you can take them to them and say, can you, uh, uh, crack and blow these for me and they'll charge you anywhere between 50 cents and 75 cents generally a pound and then if you wanted to go sell those you could or give them away to your uh, family members and such you can do that as well. Uh, Grace posted a question she asked what factors affect the price fluctuations? Uh, yeah so <laughs> there's a lot of factors that uh, create those price fluctuations on the wholesale level um, uh, I would say uh, number one factor is crop size. Uh, and weather has to do a lot with that throughout the entire country. And I'm not talking about crop size here in Oklahoma. I'm talking about now it's a worldwide crop size. But the crop size is in New Mexico and South Africa and, sub and now even these uh, countries in South America are starting to produce more and even China is starting to produce more. Uh, and, and those are the factors that create the main uh, price fluctuations. Uh, you know, if we get a um, huge hurricane in Georgia, uh, that automatically uh, jumps up the price if it goes right through the pecan belt in Georgia because Georgia is such a large producing state, uh, is the largest pecan producing state in the US right now. Uh, it has a huge impact on it. Um, droughts out west, if they have large droughts out west, uh, out in New Mexico and Arizona, um, you know, they're, if, they, if they're not able to put on the irrigation that they need, uh, that's going to have a, and create the quality that they need, that's going to have a price fluctuation. Uh, Mexico, same thing. You know, all those trees out there are all irrigated. So rain, rain is a pretty big deal for them uh, just to get a little bit of rain and the irrigation is a absolute must. The trees would actually die out there if they didn't irrigate. And so that's the, that's the main, main factors. These last few years, um, I guess, if you, if you guys were harvesting pecans about five or six years ago, um, I think it was five or six years ago, we had record prices. Uh, it was, we're getting, we're selling natives for over $2 a pound. Um, but unfortunately price and demand comes into play. So what happens when price goes up, demand comes down. And so as demand was falling, uh, there's several other factors that came in also at the same time frame. unfortunately. Uh, we had the China, China tariffs and stuff. We had, and, and then right after the China ta tariffs, that was actually starting to come back. Then we came into COVID hit and then that created less and less demand. And so those factors created some lower prices that we've seen in the last about 10 years this last year. Now those prices are starting to come back. Why? Because prices are low, creates more demand. Now, the only problem is how big is our supply? So if we have this huge supply, then prices will still be somewhat suppressed. If we have a very low supply, then prices will start going up again as well. 
So Chad, the fluctuations, like you said, it can change day to day. So those fluctuations, that is determined by those end users, right? Correct, yeah. So these shellers, the, yes. So the shellers are getting contracts and stuff um, for like a Brahms ice cream, which uses a lot of native pecans. Um, Kroger's, Costco, Walmart's, um, our way. Um, a lot of those, these big, big companies, um, you know, they'll, they'll send out contracts for, uh, you know, at least a quarter. So they'll, a quarter to half a year to a year at a time on what they're going to pay. So as these shellers are getting these contracts, they're buying, they're, they're buying to fill those contracts and they're stopping and buying and stopping, and buying and stopping. And as those are happening, you know, if, if everybody's buying at the same time, everybody's competing, generally the price is going up. Uh, and that, in the past about five years, um, it's probably been around late December, uh, first first week, first two weeks in January. That's been the high prices uh, for uh, native pecans. That doesn't mean that's what it is all the time, uh, due to supply and demand and prices and everything else. But that's generally what it has been about the last five years. Some years it's in the very beginning. If you're the very first person to sell, you're going to get paid the most. The very last person to sell, you might get paid the most. So. Um, it just varies year to year, but that's that's the trend that it has been in the last five years. All right. Well, if there's not any more questions, uh, I want to thank Chad for joining us today and appreciate your knowledge and expertise in this. And um, it's always good to hear from those experts. So we appreciate you helping us out today. Thank you, babe. All right. Um, our next speaker is another expert. Uh, we have Mike Rose. He is with Mays County Extension. He is the, the director and the Ag 4-H agent in Mays County uh, in the eastern part of the state. And so Mike's going to talk about um, soil sampling. Can you share your screen with us today, Mike? Yep. How are you? I'm good. Uh, do you see the screen yet? Looks, looks good. Okay. Well, and can you hear me okay? Sounds good. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. And this shouldn't take too, too awful long, 10 minutes or so. Uh, as Becky mentioned, I'm gonna to talk to you about how to take a soil sample. And in the first part of it's really about soil sampling. And at the very end, I'll talk a little bit more of how it specifically relates to pecan production. If you've been involved in the pecan industry, you know it's a little different than maybe some of the other crops that that we deal with. Let's see. Uh -oh. I'm uh, trying to advance my screen. Maybe let me see here. It's been a while since I've actually presented on Zoom, Becky. Um, anyway, uh, as you can read or see on this first slide, the greatest potential for error in soil testing is in taking the sample. And that's something we see in the extension office on a real regular basis. You really get the quality of information that you get is consistent with how good a sample you pull. If you're the guy that wheels in and knocks off a few clods off of your uh, mud flap and throws it in the bag and brings it into the office, yeah, you'll get a test result, but it really won't tell you a lot about what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, you know, as, as, as it says lower in the slide, results are only as good as the sample or take that's taken. So we're going to talk a little bit more about those specifics and how that impacts you as a grower. So when we got, talk about collecting a good soil sample, one of the easiest ways to accomplish that is, is the first, uh, if you don't currently own a soil probe, go to your local county extension office and borrow a soil probe or a sweatless soil probe. That'll make the process much simpler, much easier, and allow you to get a good sample. In this slide, you can see uh, the stainless steel soil probe. I like it because it has a foot peg, makes it a little bit easier to collect those samples. Uh, it works really well in most soils that don't have a lot of rocks and that has some soil moisture. You look at the sweatless soil probe, that's essentially the, uh, ship auger bit that's attached to a cordless drill with a bucket. That works really good in really rocky soils or dry soil. It doesn't work so well if you have wet, heavy clay soil because then it will stick to the bucket. 
When you go through the process of collecting that sample, you'd like to collect 20 plugs randomly from the area that you're testing. I would generally encourage you not to test a, an area much more than 40 or 60 acres. It's generally not very expensive to do a soil test. And as you get over larger and larger areas, uh, you're, you're using really a pretty small amount of soil to make large financial decisions. Uh, you know, an, uh, a furrow slice, an acre, uh, an acre of soil that's six inches deep is two million pounds. So you're, you're dealing with a lot of soil there and you're trying to get information to make management decisions. You can, of course, test anywhere from as small as a garden, but I probably wouldn't do much more than 40 or 60 acres. When you go about that, you're going to randomly select 20 or take 20 plugs randomly from the area that you're going to test. You're going to avoid any manure piles or any urine spots, anything that you obviously know has higher nutrient content. If there's an area out there, say the size of your house or something that nothing ever grows in, don't include that in your routine soil test. Um, that might throw the information off or the, or the variables verbal off. You may go back and test that soil later for salinity management or something separate, but I'd pull that separate sample separate and do that at a different time. Uh, you want to pull those soil samples at a six inch soil depth. Reason being is because that's the way the uh, equipment is calibrated at the soils lab. And that's where a vast majority of your roots are going to be. If you are in a situation where you can't get very much soil, if you just pull something right off the top, the top one or two inches, uh, you're typically going to read higher in phosphorus and potassium than maybe uh, the soil really is at that full six inch profile. The reason being the phosphorus and potassium are generally regarded as immobile nutrients, so they don't move through the soil uh, like nitrogen would with the moisture and things. So as it's spread out there, whether that be with fertilizer or manure or whatever else is used to do it, then it tends to accumulate a little higher towards the top surface of the soil. You want to take those samples and you want to put those in a clean bucket that's never had fertilizer in it. And honestly, it'd be okay if it had fertilizer, if you'd take it and wash it and clean it out, but you don't want any dust or anything like that because those would impact the soil test. But you put those in that clean bucket, you mix that up really good. And then you're gonna, when you go borrow that soil probe, you're gonna pick up a soil bag. We'd like for you to fill that bag completely with soil. You can actually go ahead and collect or send in a sample if it's at least five and a half ounces of soil. The lab will go ahead and run that if it's at that low of volume, but you really want a full bag because the soil lab is going to take that, they're going to grind that sample up itself, and then they are going to pull about a thimble full of soil out of that to actually run the test. That's why it's really important that you do a good job of getting a representative sample of your field, and that's why it's really important that you mix those plugs that you collect really well because you're going to end up using a very small volume of soil to complete the test. Okay, when you get that sample pulled, you'll return that to your local county extension office. Typically, it takes about two weeks or 10 working days to get your soil test report back. There are times that it gets done quicker if the mail works and everything works properly, the soil lab's not too busy, but if we tell you that it's going to be any faster than that, we can guarantee you that won't happen. Um, when the uh, extension office will ask you some questions about your sample, depending on what crop you're growing, may ask you some questions about the yield goal and things like that, but they'll collect that information uh, to be included with the test results that you get back. Oftentimes when I'm collecting soil samples like that, uh, you'll end up having about double the soil that you need if you're using the soil probe. What I'll do is after I've mixed that thoroughly, I'll put field of soil bag, but I'll also keep one bag myself just in case something happens in the mail, the soil sample doesn't make it to the soil lab as you intended. It's a lot easier to pull that sample out and reuse it than it is to go and collect another sample. In this particular slide, it simply talks about the cost for the soil samples, a routine soil analysis, which gives you soil pH, a buffer index, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium is 
So that's been that same price for the 24 years that I've worked in extension. I know Highlands worked real hard to keep that affordable to those of you that are soil testing. You can get some additional secondary nutrients for an additional charge of $4 and micronutrients for $4. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in the next slide. You can test for organic matter for $8 and that'll tell you the general organic matter of the soil, which is good for water holding capacity, some other things. And some other thoughts regarding that while I've got it on the slide is, if you get that soil sample back and the information just doesn't look right, and oftentimes your county extension agent will look at these soil tests, you should look at them. And if something's just way off track, uh, you can request to have that sample uh, reanalyzed. The soils lab will keep that sample for a month, sometimes longer if they're not moving a lot of soil samples at that time of the year. And they can rerun that test if you let them know uh, that there may be an issue with that soil test in a pretty timely manner. And then, as I mentioned before, I go ahead and save the extra soil that I've collected uh, so that in case it, get lost, it gets lost in the mail. Now, if you use the sweatless soil probe, it won't collect as much soil as the normal push-in soil probe, so you may not have quite as much soil to save and, and use in case you need it. This slide specifically tells you more of what's the details of what's involved in some of those other tests. We'd mention the routine test is pH, buffer index, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. I'll talk a little bit about those in the next slide, I believe. Secondary nutrients that can be tested are sulfur, magnesium, and calcium. And micronutrients are iron, zinc, and boron. Most Oklahoma soils are not normally deficient in secondary or micronutrients, generally speaking. But there are situations, like if you've used uh, a same field to grow alfalfa, I've had this occur before numerous years in a row, uh, it ends up having a boron deficiency. So it can happen, and, and it's good to test that occasionally uh, for some different crops. As mentioned before, some of the other tests that can be done are soil texture, salinity management, and comprehensive salinity management. So the soils lab does a good job of, of having a good number of different tests that they can do to help you as a grower. This slide is showing uh, basically a handout that I put together that tells you some of the things that you'll get back on your soil test and kind of what some of those numbers mean. It tells you about how many samples to collect, um, some of the other tests that are available. One of the points I want to mention, and you can read it on the screen, is uh, if you remember from your chemistry class in high school, uh, one of the things that we talk about is the pH scale, and that ranges from 1 to 14. But it's been a long time since I've been in chemistry, and maybe some of you are in that situation. But it's important to remember that a pH of 4.0 is 10 times more acidic than a pH of 5.0. So, so even though those numbers are not greatly different, there is a big difference in pH. And then you compare a 4.0 to a pH of 6.0, and that's a hundred times difference or a hundred times more acidic for that 4.0 soil compared to 6.0 soil. And that's sometimes why we see instances where the pH number is not that different, but there's a big difference in what is growing or how plants perform in that environment. Some other things that we can think about, of course, the pH doesn't change very quickly in the soil. Uh, so it's something that's a slow term process for that to occur. Some other information that's uh, important or you may need to know, maybe not as much for your pecan test, but for other crops is it, it shows percent sufficiency. And I know this slide is not very clear, but I'll explain it to you here real quickly. Uh, for each of the values or for the phosphorus and potassium, it has a percent sufficient. In this example, it says 70% sufficient phosphorus. What that means is if you put the nitrogen that's required, the pH is good, uh, and you but you and you put the potassium that's listed, and you chose not to put the phosphorus out there that's listed, then you would get 70% of the expected yield goal. So it's a great way for you to kind of get a feel for how important phosphorus is uh, for that particular soil test or your soil there. Uh, also, the phosphorus and potassium are somewhat connected or interrelated meaning on this example, if the phosphorus is 70% sufficient and the potassium is 75% sufficient, 
if you put the nitrogen that was required, the pH was not a problem, but you just didn't have the money to put the P and K out, you could multiply 0 0.70 times 0 0.75. And I don't think, and this example is incorrect, but that would end up giving you 52 and a half percent sufficient. So what that's saying is, you spent the money for the nitrogen and you ended up getting only 52 and a half percent of the expected yield. So in this particular soil sample, uh, the phosphorus and potassium were pretty important, necessary for you to include in order to get good growth or production. Uh, and then finally, something more specific with pecans. Uh, when you're starting a new orchard or a new pecan uh, planting, uh, it's a great time to pull a soil test. It's a perfect opportunity for, for you to correct any significant nutrient deficiencies. As I mentioned, uh, lime slow, uh, changes pH slowly in the soil, what might allow you to incorporate that lime, or if you have a, a major phosphorus deficiency, you can do those changes or make those changes right up front and put yourself in position to allow those young trees to grow well from the very beginning. And as a lot of you may already know in established orchards though, soil testing is not as critical because leaf analysis is the preferred method of identifying nutritional deficiencies in pecan trees. I did a bit of research trying to figure out specifically why that was. And the simplest explanation I could get is it's more efficient. The leaf analysis does a, basically a more efficient, better job of telling you what nutrient deficiencies those trees have. And Becky may add to that, tell us more about that if she'd like. Though it is still useful to go ahead and get a soil test in your established orchards every three to five years, it really allows you to keep a track of the soil pH and, and some of those other nutrient levels. And pH is important for you because it impacts uh, how, how the trees maybe take up zinc and some other important nutrients as well. Uh, with that being said, I think that was the end of my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Do we have any questions for, for Mike? I know on the, the leaf sampling, um, on the soil test, it tells us what is in the soil. But on a leaf test, it tells us exactly what that tree is able to take up from the soil. So if there's an imbalance in some of those nutrients, it may not show up in the soil test, but if we read our leaf test and get those results, it tells us exactly what that tree is able to uh, effectively take up from the soil. So we can, can um, address some of those issues um, looking at what it is able to extract from the soil. That's, that's the best the best um, answer I would have on that. So um, Grace asked, how do we request a leaf test? Um, you would do, uh, you would go to your county extension office, uh, just like with a soil test, and uh, you can collect that sample, then take the sample to the office. And a leaf, uh, leaf test is $20. Uh, it has to be completed in July to get an accurate uh, test. And so that timing is very specific to, um, to getting accurate results. And all the setup for the lab is, is based on where the nutrients are at that time of the season. So um, let me see. So I have information on our fact sheet that talks about um, fertilizer for pecan and fruit trees. And if you take a look at that fact sheet, I think it's HLA 6232. It talks about how to do a leaf, a leaf test. And if you have questions, you can always contact me or your county educator, but you submit them through, the, through that county extension office. Um, Kurt asks, do you do both leaf and soil testing and work from there or do, just do either one of the tests? What, do you, what would you suggest, Mike? Um, it would be useful to have both. Uh, it just gives you more information to start with. I wouldn't say it's absolutely necessary if you've got an established orchard to, to do the soil test. Uh, but boy, it's sure nice to know what your pH is. It gives you an idea of, of maybe how your trees are going to respond to that particular fertilizer. So, so I suggest on, on establishment, make sure that you do your soil test before you, you plant. 
And that way you can um, change up things, you know, those, those phosphorus, potassium, the pH, you can adjust that much easier before you have trees in place. So you incorporate it in the soil. And then every three to five years, test your soil to kind of see how your you look. And if you see something starting to get out of balance, then you need to address that. Most of the time, only the only nutrients that are deficient in our orchards are going to be nitrogen and zinc. And so those are the two nutrients that we need to usually apply annually. And so, um, so having the soil test gives us that base test, but the leaf samples, I like to do those every year or every other year to see where we are. Nothing can get out of balance too quickly. And they're only $20. It's not a lot of money to spend. Uh, if you go through another lab, I think they're usually probably around uh, $50 or so, but it's, it's well worth the money because you know exactly what you need to fertilize with. And then Grace asked how to collect leaves for your leaf test. Um, that fact sheet, or we have, um, if you go back to July, you can take a look at the Zoom from July and it goes over leaf sampling for those tests. But I'd be happy to visit with you if you have questions about that later. And then Chad posts, are there any plants that help with phosphorus and potassium like clover that helps with nitrogen? I don't know of any, do you, Mike? No, I wish there were. Uh, we'd all be using them, Chad. Yeah, it, uh, you know, and, and clover is, you don't really want to fertilize with nitrogen if you have clover in the orchard because it will, that not, the clover will not um, fix any more nitrogen but they will benefit from phosphorus and potassium um, on your clover for, for growth. Um, let's see, Kurt asked, with regards to leaf testing, how many leaves per block or hectare to test? Um, normally a sample is going to be, we test over areas that are similar. So in our case at the research station, we have blocks of Pawnee, we have a block of Kansas, we have a block of Merrimack. So we'll do a test from each one of those blocks. If you have trees that are that don't look right, that look like they're sick or they have problems, you'd wanna sample those separately. If you have areas with different soil conditions, you'd wanna sample those areas differently as well. But normally you want to um, sample from a consistent, uh, similar tree. If you have a native area, uh, you sample native trees based on a similar site. That would, would be helpful. But usually, um, we don't want to do it over too large of an area, but it can be, you know, 40 to 60 acres, like Mike was saying. You can do it over a, a large area. But the more detailed, the more samples, then the more, uh, you know, accurate your results will be as well. So any other questions? Any other questions for, for Chad or for Mike or myself? All right, well, if you have a question, you're always um, encouraged, you can email me and I can answer your question or find someone who can. Um, get you in touch with one of the speakers that's been on. I uh, want to encourage you to join us for our November 5th webinar, and that will be our last one for this 2021 season. Uh, we'll, I'm not sure of the topics just yet, but it will be um, things that are appropriate for that time of the season. We'll see what kind of uh, what kind of topics and speakers I can drum up before our next uh, next one. So if you have suggestions, things that you'd like to see, send me an email and I'll uh, look at trying to fill some of those, those uh, requests. I wanna thank everyone for participating. I wanna thank Mike and Chad, especially for tuning in today and uh, presenting their information. And uh, thank everyone for, for uh, joining us and we will see you again in November. Thank you. See you later, Chad. Bye, Mike. I'll go ahead and end it. You guys Thank have you, a good Thank you, Thank you. See y'all later.